So we're thinking about Advent, and in this afternoon session, I just want us to think about what is our own attitude going to be in this time of waiting. So we've we've established that the framework, we know what Advent is, we know we're waiting, we're waiting for Christmas, we're waiting for the second coming, we're waiting to meet the Lord. So what is the attitude, what, what do we bring in our hearts and minds to this time of waiting? And just to approach this is a little bit random, but I, I think it's working. I've, I've just chosen to look at, in fact, the first three. Um, the second reading from the Sundays, the first, second and third Sundays of Advent, just to provide a thread, because in fact, each of these New Testament readings, St Paul and St Peter, is talking about this question very explicitly. Jesus is coming back. The second coming is coming, the parousia. What are, what are we going to do in this time? What should be our attitude? And actually in these three Sundays, the first three Sundays, we get quite different answers about how to use this time. And that's what I found helpful, just to share these with you. So let's just go through and have about ten minutes on each one and then just just tie these thoughts together. And I'm going to read them. So we'll treat this a little bit like a, a meditation, a Lexio Divina. So the first Sunday of Advent, year B, the second reading, St Paul's letter, um, the first Corinthians, chapter 1, 3 to 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that was given you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So it's very explicit there in the middle, isn't it? As you wait for the revealing of Jesus Christ, an Advent message, what are you going to do? Well, here's my summary of St Paul's message in this first reading that we're thinking about. It is, remember the gifts. Remember the gifts. So this is the very beginning of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And yes, part of what he's doing here is rhetorical. He's flattering the Corinthians before he goes in with his punches, starts undermining their giftedness. <coughs> Excuse me. But nevertheless, there is a central truth here that he chooses to begin his whole exhortation in the light of the second coming, with a reminder of, you can see it there in front of you, the grace of God that was given you, that you were enriched in all speech and all knowledge, and even more emphatically, that you are not lacking any gift as you wait. So just to say again, Part of what we're called to do in this time of waiting during Advent is to remember the gifts that we have been given. The human gifts, the human qualities, and especially the spiritual gifts, the graces that we've been given in general through the sacraments, through our ordination. To be grateful for these gifts. So first of all, remembering just looking over your shoulder and thinking, oh yes, I, I received that back then, and, and it's still a part of me, and this is what happened to me. So there is a reminiscing, but with a, a healthy reminiscing, hopefully comes a spirit of gratitude for these gifts, which we often forget about. I do think it is a great plague on all of us, on everyone, every human person, <laughs> 
on every Christian and certainly on every deacon, priest and bishop to be thinking all the time that we have not been given enough. If only I had what this other person had. If only I had what the priest next door in the next door parish had to me. If I only had what the bishop in the next door diocese had. If I only had the spiritual gifts that they have. If I only had the human qualities they have. If only I had the, the contextual parish community possibilities that they had. If only. If only I was in a different situation. If only I was a different person, if only you were a different God <laughs> who made me a different person. So this can be very light, very light-hearted, wistful. It can be deeply corrosive when it becomes envy and jealousy and then it leads to backbiting and recriminations and undermining. Or even worse, it can just be quietly crippling. Quite subtle this, I think. The effect in our spiritual lives of wishing that we had what we don't have, of wanting what others have, of thinking, this is the fundamental problem, that we don't have what we need for this situation, this work, this, this life. So St Paul and myself are saying a big no to this. It is, it is a lie. It is a lie when you read the beginning of Corinthians. Because the truth is, it's proclaimed to us by St Paul, that we have been given exactly what we need and more. We've been given the right tool for the job. Put it very kind of crudely like that. Yes, you're sitting there holding a spanner, wishing you had a saw, holding a screwdriver, wishing you had a hammer. Well, the Lord's given you this to do some work for his reasons. How can you use your tools, your gifts, human, spiritual, pastoral? Um, he has given you what you need. And if it doesn't seem that you can do the work that you want to do, that you think he wants to do, to actually challenge yourself to say, really, this is a very St. Therese of Lisieux theme, isn't it? No, this is where he's put me. This is the person he's made me. He could have called someone much better equipped. He hasn't. He's put me here in this parish with my weaknesses and limitations and my gifts. Some of them I haven't discovered yet. Many of them I have. So this is what he wants. And just to knock on the head for once the idea that he really wants someone else or something else done. Why has he put me here? So I can do something. So I can do his work. And to trust that I can do the possibly very little work, the very limited, very fragile work, but this, this tiny work that he's put into my hands, I can do. Part of this is just humbly recognising, OK, what can I do, what can I can't do? This, is, this isn't very spiritual, is it? You, you go to any management consultant and they'll tell you this, yeah? Just, just wake up and, and be real and, and, and be realistic and stop fantasising. But, but some of it is, is very spiritual indeed. It's recognising the gifts of the Holy Spirit that God has given you. The gifts that you share with every other Christian, amazing gifts of, of baptism and confirmation. The particular gifts that you've been given through your ordination. And the, the unique, the special charisms that God has given you that you might not even have discovered yet, but that you have been given. Again, to remember, to recognise, to be grateful and, and therefore to be liberated to use the very small limited gifts you have, but to use them confidently without fear. I was talking uh, with a group of students in, in some catechesis only um, three days ago about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I was saying, just like I've said to you, actually, isn't it amazing the gifts that God gave you through your baptism and confirmation? 
And one of the students came back at me very unaggressively, but just very humbly. Look, I was confirmed when I was 12, 20 years ago. Um, I don't feel any of this. I, I don't remember receiving anything. I don't feel I received anything. It didn't, it didn't change me at all. I believe what you're saying, but, but it doesn't seem to have much effect in my life. And then just as a group, we, we, I threw it back to the group. I said, well, what do you think? And just the ideas, the analogies of what it means to receive a gift that has gone unused or unacknowledged without going the next step and saying, I didn't really receive the gift, which isn't true. All the images in the scriptures, all the parables of seeds growing. The seed is given. It's there. It's germinating. It's, it's sprouting. But it hasn't grown to be the tree. But everything that the, the, the tree is, is there. Of course it needs nurturing, and that's another story. But just the gift, the seed is there. And another student just came up with the idea that you, you buy, I can't remember what the example was, call it a mobile phone. You, you, you buy the electrical appliance, the fridge, the, the, the mobile phone, you buy the car. You've, you've got to plug it in. You've got to switch it on. You've got to turn the ignition. All the gifts are there, but we don't always start them, get them going. And of course, at a theological level, and we had a great discussion, this got into the, the discussion, which is good for us. We need good theology yeah, about grace, of how grace is given through the sacraments, the particular graces that are given, that it doesn't depend... Uh, I was had a great discussion with them about the validity of sacraments. It doesn't depend on the worthiness of the minister or the, the person who receives and celebrates. Um, but, of course, the fruitfulness of the grace does depend on our openness to the gift. This is just textbook Catholic theology, isn't it? The fruitfulness of the grace depends on our openness to the gift. So... It, knowing we've received these gifts, human, spiritual, pastoral, what does it raise? What questions does it raise? It raises the question, <coughs> how can I use the gifts more? How can I nurture them? The biblical language of the seed growing. And I'm not going to give you the answers here. I'm just sending you a way to think about these things during Advent, to, to recognise them. What does it mean to nurture my gifts? For the Lord to nurture them, for me to nurture them, for, for the community. What does it mean to exercise those gifts? A different language. The language of virtue, yes? The virtues need exercising. That is what a virtue is, actually. It is a habit. It's, it's good practice. It's something we've learned, we've done, we've grown and we're more experienced at. And it's become a part of us. It's become second nature, to use the Aristotelian language. Am I <coughs> exercising my gifts? You can't be brave without... You can't sit there saying, well, I'm not brave. I'm just not brave. Someone else is brave. Yeah. To, to be brave, you've got to get up and be brave. To be generous, you can't say, well, oh, that priest next door, he's really generous. You know, I'm just not like that. Well, you're like that if you get up and be generous and be kind and be forgiving and be loving. This is what a virtue is. It is a gift, especially the supernatural virtues. And in fact, the, the human virtues, the, the natural virtues are gifts renewed through the Holy Spirit and through the sacraments. But we have to exercise them. But the flip side of this question of gifts is not just how do I nurture them and exercise them, it's what is getting in the way of me using them. And apart from what we've been talking about, not using them, fear, hiding your gifts, your talent in the ground, etc., of course the one killer obstacle to the exercise of the gifts is sin. <coughs> That sin gets in the way of us using any of our gifts for good, but especially the spiritual gifts. And of course, I wanted to say to these students in the group, God never takes away his graces 
and he doesn't take them away. But we can, again, just good sound Catholic theology, we can lose the grace, the graces we've been given, and especially the sacramental graces we've been given, the vocational graces, through mortal sin. Venial sin stops the grace growing, stops us growing in holiness, but it's different from mortal sin, which actually undermines the very roots, uproots the very roots, and, and, and cuts us off from the stream of living grace and living water. So the first thing we need to do, all of us, lay people, priests, is to recognise that sin gets in the way, and this is part of the penitential aspect of Advent, uh, it's not. It's got a different flavour to Lent. It's it's wanting. To, I'm going to come on to this in part two. But it's wanting to get rid of sin so that we can get on with the work of of living and growing in in holiness. Um, so just to be open to confession in our own lives and encouraging others that too, and to remember in the light of gifts that one of the gifts of confession is that it renews the graces of all the sacraments that we have received up to that confession. It renews the vocational graces. So never think that when you're going to confession, or when you're speaking about confession to others, that, that you are just receiving the grace of forgiveness. The grace of forgiveness and mercy is the first gift of confession, but then the effect of that is to release and renew all of the gifts that were given to you in baptism and confirmation and for married people in the, the sacrament of marriage and for ourselves in the sacrament of ordination. So do you see what an, an amazing gift the grace of confession is? It's like celebrating all the other sacraments that you've celebrated before then in one blast. I think that's correct theology. You can correct me if it's not. And just last point here, everything I've just said, I'm speaking to you, this is a day of recollection for you as individuals, as it were, but everything I've said applies to everyone. So everything I've said about gifts, recognising them, renewing them, being grateful, releasing them, going to confession so that you can live them, it applies to your parishioners, your friends and your family, and it applies to our communities. That your parish community has been given the gifts that it needs. Again, the temptation to think, if only I had different parishioners. <laughs> yeah? How much could I do, I? How much could I do, brackets, well, God do through me, through us, but how much could I do if I had the right parishioners? If I had people who would be the catechists, the readers, the extraordinary ministers, the youth workers, the evangelists, the, the finance people, the, the, the teachers, the parents, the everything. Yeah. Do you see the temptation? Instead of thinking, this is our community, this is our family, Surely God knows better than I do what we need. The gifts that go untapped, unacknowledged, and how much God can do through our communities if only we could unlock the gifts that are there. This isn't strictly true theologically, I know this. Yeah, The notion in uh, scholastic theology and lots of magisterial writings of perfect society... And you know that the perfect society, in theological terms, means the community that has all the gifts necessary for it to function as a, a coherent, surviving, self-sustaining community. It's like the polis of ancient Greece. You've got everything that you need. You've got government, bakers, lawmakers, parents, children, schools. So perfect society isn't an ideal society, it is a society that has all the gifts it needs to function. In textbook Catholic theology, the diocese is a perfect society. That's why we call the local diocese a church, not a part of the church. So in, every di in your diocese of Shrewsbury, you have 
absolutely defined by magisterial documents everything that you need to be the most perfect diocese in the world, to the, be the full embodiment of church without wanting anything else from anywhere. That's, that's true. But my, my extension of this truth is, and it's, it's three quarters true, but I'm just throwing it to you, to treat your parishes like that. That a parish, I'm not being textbook theological with you, I'm being pastorally encouraging with you, to treat it as a community, basically what I've just said, where God loves your community, he cares for it, he's the shepherd, he's the gardener, he's the master, he's given you what you need. And your job as the pastor is, is not to complain of what you haven't got, but to discover what you have got in your community and to release it. What are the charisms in your community? The graces? What hasn't been opened up? What are people longing to do and you don't know about it? And they haven't got the nerve to tell you because you haven't been open to it. Or you've never asked them. What are people longing to do, but they don't know about it? Because they don't have the confidence. Or they've never had the gifts of the Spirit explained to them. The gifts that God gives to us, to you and me, to our communities, to our parishioners. So that's part one. The second reflection... So this is the second Sunday of Advent, year B, Peter's second letter, chapter 3, and I'm just going to read the first paragraph and then a couple of phrases from the second paragraph. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfil his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And just to ping pull out two other phrases from the next paragraph. You should live lives of holiness and godliness. And then the last line, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Second letter of Peter. Excuse me while I just take my jumper off here. So, that's our second reading, and the second theme that I'm pulling out of this is repent and be holy. Very simple. This is what we're doing in the time of waiting. Repent and be holy. So, we are waiting... As I said this morning, we should rightly feel a healthy sense of frustration. Why hasn't the Lord come yet? Why do I miss him? I know he's here, but I miss him, and there's a sense of incompletion and, and waiting and longing. What am I going to do with this time? Is it just a waste of time? Well, no, we have the answer here. This time of waiting is not a delay. It's not that Jesus missed the bus and the next one hasn't come yet it is a gift and it's a specific gift of time says St Peter so that we can repent and prepare for his coming that is what this time is about it couldn't be more explicit could it than in this letter the Lord's come he's given us all these gifts he's promised to take us with him why hasn't he taken us yet? Why are we still waiting? It's specifically so that we have time to repent and be holy. To live lives, as we've heard, of holiness, godliness, without spot or blemish, at peace with God and with one another. 
This, if you like, is the purpose of our lives. This is the fundamental Christian vocation. And I think that this is quite a challenge to both the, the culture of our times and to our particular theology of the moment, of where we are in our church instinctively. Because we instinctively think, and I'm not saying this is bad, but it's one-sided, we instinctively think uh, the reason you must be good and holy is in order to do good things, to achieve things. Why should you be holy and good? So that you can do good things. And of course, you can't separate being holy and good from doing good things. And of course, it's partly true. And it's the parable of the talents we had, isn't it, last week? Yes, you're given gifts. The job is to use them. And, and don't sit about saying, oh, well, I'm holy, I've looked after the talent, it's safe in the ground, if you haven't got your hands dirty and done something with it. So that's true. But I'm just putting the other side, which is also true, that the reason for living good lives, for doing good, is in order to be holy. The reason to do good things is to be a good person which we don't think very instinctively. <coughs> because, as we know, God doesn't need us to achieve things. He can do anything without us if he wants. He could put us all in front of the television and just miraculously get all the hard work, loving to-do list done that we all carry around with us. I don't mean priests, bishops and deacons, I mean everyone. He, he could do it all, couldn't he? He's God. We don't, he doesn't need us to achieve things, but he chooses to use us to achieve things, and he wants us to be holy, to be holy, to be without blemish, this biblical language, so that when we meet Christ, the only ultimate thing that matters, as St. Peter says, this isn't me, is that we are able to stand before him, at peace with him, with a pure heart and living a life of holiness. And I think that this is a challenge for us, because, again, it's partly historical reactions, isn't it? The notion that, that you should be holy and then the idea, well, is that selfish and it can become a sort of introverted piety which is more concerned with self than other, and surely that's not holiness, is it? And it isn't, because holiness is about going outside oneself, loving God, loving our neighbour, living a life of sacrificial service. So you can tie yourself in knots about this of, well, can I try to be holy or is that inherently selfish? But just, just cut through all that and just live with the, the word of God and we are called to do good deeds and to love others and to be holy and pure and blameless and spotless. Let's just hold the two together in a relatively uncomplicated way. But I want to remind you of this aspect of the call to holiness for its own sake, if you like, because I think that there is a danger always in the church, but maybe particularly today, in the church and for us priests and deacons and bishops that we can become functionalist the old-fashioned word for this heresy was activism wasn't it yeah we can become functionalist we can think that the purpose of our ministry and the measure of our ministry is getting things done externally and we f can forget about our own salvation All these wonderful exhortations from popes throughout the centuries, um, all these writings about the danger for the minister, the pastor, of caring about the salvation of his flock in a very activist way and forgetting about his own salvation. Part of this, again, is common sense. It's management cons consultancy speak. 
you know, it's don't work so that you kill yourself because you're no use to anyone. That's true. But there is a spiritual aspect to this. That God has asked us to care for our own souls as well as for the souls of others. And actually, this is the next point, we are only caring for the souls of others if we are caring for our own souls. Because what the church needs and what our people need is that we are living lives of holiness and a genuine interior goodness, a love, an interior love of God and of our neighbour, a love from the heart and the soul and the depth of our being and not just a functional love. I'm not knocking hard work and graft here. Sometimes, very often, we just have to function and that is a great gift of the priest and the deacon and the bishop. So I'm not knocking hard work, but just the desire is that everything we do is growing out of a genuine, felt, sincere love for the Lord and love for our neighbour. In other words, the external activity of good works is coherent with the inner heart with the inner love. The service of holiness is inseparable from the life, the interior life of holiness. So I would say that our fundamental vocation is to lead others to holiness. I'm just back to Peter's letter now. Through, as St Peter says, repentance, prayer, goodness, love, sincerity. And actually, that anything we're doing that seems very worthwhile, that isn't leading people to conversion and to repentance and to, to reconciliation with God, is at the very least lacking something, and at the worst might be fatally flawed. The ultimate measure of all of our works, of all of our projects, whether it's diocesan level or whether it's what you do with your day as a, as a priest or a deacon, the ultimate measure is are we helping people to grow closer to the Lord, to grow in holiness, if it's needed to, to repent, to be reconciled with God, to live a life that is worthy of the Lord, worthy of our Christian faith, and through that, to live generous, outgoing lives that are changing the world and that are external. Again, it's not an in, a selfish interiority, this. So, that's the message of the second Sunday of Advent, Year B. St Peter's second letter. Repent, be holy. Because... Just to sum up, we need to hear that message for ourselves as Christians. Our people need to hear that message for themselves and we need to lead them to holiness. And the third leg of, of the stool is that they need us to be holy in order to lead them to holiness. There's a lot of implications of St. Pe Peter's simple exhortation of repent and be holy. And the last, the third point, the third thought for Advent, the third Sunday of Advent year B, the second reading, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Very short, I'll read this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. 
So there's an echo of the previous point here, isn't there? Just to reinforce it. Yes. Be blameless at the coming of the Lord. The Lord's coming. Interesting. Not the Lord's coming look busy, as the phrase goes, but the Lord's coming be blameless. But the, the, the new, the third point I want to make from this letter here is simply that this time of waiting is a time to pray. To pray. Now, you can go to a spiritual conference any time and the, the, the speaker will say we need to pray. But do you see I'm trying to give a particular context to this. The reason we're praying is because we're waiting. And this is the last thought I want to share. So, in the letter to the Th first letter to the Thessalonians here in chapter 5, the exhortation to pray without ceasing, it's given a specific link with the need for waiting. We are praying without ceasing because we are waiting for the Lord to come. And that this prayer includes here, it's the same sentence, isn't it? Rejoicing, praying without ceasing, and gratitude, giving thanks. It's rejoicing as a form of prayer. To rejoice. Not just, did you wake up in a good mood this morning? That's neither here nor there. But actively, prayerfully, to rejoice. And it's to give thanks. Not just, are you feeling grateful this morning? But actively, positively, prayerfully, to give thanks, to be grateful. I happened to pick up this quotation from Chesterton about gratitude yesterday and it, it betrays all the the innocent heart you know how childlike Chesterton is yes in his writings just listen I think it's from a poem it's written in poetic form here Chesterton says here dies another day during which I have had eyes ears hands and the great world round me and with tomorrow begins another why am I allowed to? Why am I allowed to? The amazement that I've been given one day. Isn't it a miracle that I might go to bed tonight, switch the alarm clock on, switch the light off, and it might begin again tomorrow? And another quote, I won't read them all, I just picked up this list of Chesterton quotes. Again, another quote from Chesterton. You say grace before meals. All right. But I say grace before the concert and grace before the play and grace before I open a book and grace before painting, swimming, playing, walking and grace before I pick up my pen. He just had a naturally grateful heart. And St Paul saying to us, we need to cultivate gratitude. It's a command. It's, a, it's an imperative Rejoice, pray without ceasing, give thanks. So this is simple. OK, I go to a day of recollection and there's the speaker saying I should pray more. Yes, I know I should. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but remember, this is praying because we're waiting for Christ. And it gives it an extra meaning, an extra urgency. I'm not saying, I haven't said, you notice... I talked about this Advent being St. Martin's Lent. I'm not saying you should take up an Advent penance. You might choose to. I don't know if that's a tradition in Catholic communities. I'm not suggesting that anyway. You can if you want. But I am suggesting that like Lent, but in a different frame, you take up an Advent prayer. And I would say to you, like Chesterton might say to you, be joyful, childlike, in trying to pray in a different way from how you're used to pray, to, to praying. Instead of treating the call to prayer in Advent like a burden, yeah? Oh, I haven't been saying my office enough, I ought to. Well, yes, you ought to, but that's another question, yeah? Or, well, I suppose I ought to pray the rosary, I was never very good at it, there was a time when I used to, and maybe I ought to, and I'll try, yeah? No, just to knock on the head, guilt. 
in terms of prayer and to treat the four weeks of Advent as an invitation to joyfully, like a little child, like someone who has just been baptised, say, wow, God's given me another month. Let's imagine I'm going to die on Christmas Day. He's given me a month. How can I pray? How can I use this time? What can I discover? If I've been praying in one way, what's a new way? So, just to provoke you, can I say, try something interesting, challenging, different. Uh, look something up. Ask a friend. Uh, say to a friend, OK, tell me a way of praying. I'll do it, whatever you tell me. Be careful what you wish for. Um, let's be a bit random here. Yeah? If you're not a touchy-feely priest, yeah? why not try being a touchy-feely priest? <laughs> and, and light a candle. And, and take out a beautiful tablecloth and put some icons on it in your living room and, and put a beanbag on the floor. Yeah? If this is not you, um, try it. Put on some Taze music, some whale music. Put on whatever you like, you know, but just try it and be different. If you are not a traditionalist, try getting out one of those beautiful books of, of Latin prayers where you've got the parallel English text on the other side and, and read them slowly like a form of lexio. OK, your Latin isn't great, but don't worry and just enjoy it. If you're very conservative, um, traditionally English, Irish in your mentality, your spirituality, um, I'm English, you know, I'm the same, I don't like to be too expressive, I'm, you know, all the, all the English characteristics that we're meant to have. Um, well, look, take your hat off. Um, try something different. Try, try the physical expressiveness of St. Dominic's Nine Ways of Praying. Yeah? Have you got a booklet of these? Look them up on the internet. Try praying, if you can manage it, prostrate on the floor. Try kneeling with your arms out in, in supplication. Uh, try standing before the Lord. It's not a common gesture for English, Irish culture, is it? The French, the Italians, many others, they pray by standing, don't they? They're the ones that come to Mass. They come to Holy Communion. Everyone else is kneeling and they're standing there. Yeah? But that's how they pray, physically. If you're naturally a very charismatic, expressive person and you haven't had silence for ages, Try ten minutes of absolute silence with nothing else happening every morning. And yes, if you haven't prayed the rosary for weeks or years, why not say, I'm going to pray a decade of the rosary every day of Advent. Be brave, be bold, be fun. And just think, gosh, it would be lovely to pray this Advent be lovely to try something new and even if you get to the end and it isn't you it's helped to open up something in you that maybe wouldn't have been opened up otherwise i'm assuming you're doing the basics yes i'm assuming that we're going to mass as priests and deacons that we're trying to pray our breviary that we have some time of meditation in the morning or whatever <laughs> all i'm saying is this advent have some fun don't take yourself so seriously and think outside the box and it might make a difference in terms of your prayer. And to see Paul's exhortations as, I've already said this but just to underline it, as verbs. I'm going to contradict this in a minute. But first of all, to see that prayer is an active doing, partly. So, to give thanks is different from whether we feel grateful or happy, isn't it? To give thanks, to use the scholastic language, is an act of the will. And we choose to do it. We choose to look at what God has given us. We choose to say thank you. And if we don't do that looking and that speaking and that choosing, we will not be grateful. To rejoice is a verb. I don't think there's a verb too happy, is there? I can't say you there, happy, as a verb. I can say be happy, like a state, 
But the verb that we have, that Paul uses, the Greek, the, the, the English, is rejoice. It's not about an emotional state of happiness. Because we feel, sometimes, grumpy, miserable, the wrong side of the bed, and even worse, we feel in a dark place sometimes. Psychologically, spiritually, physically. But all the time, says St Paul, we can still rejoice. Because rejoice, rejoicing, again, is something we choose, we give, we say. That lovely story about Mother Teresa saying to her nuns as they leave the convent in the morning, give joy, go out and give joy to the people that you meet. Be joyful as a choice, as a, as a free gift that you give to God and that you give to others. So we need to do, to verb. To, to, to act. But to remember, this is the last point now, that ultimately the praying, the, the prayer, the prayerfulness is not our doing. It is God's doing. <laughs> First of all, as we know, that any prayer is only because the Holy Spirit is praying within us and inspiring us to pray. But to recognise that actually the, the fact of praying, the content of prayer, if you like, is paradoxically recognising that God is the giver and the doer, isn't it? In other words, when I make efforts to pray, what I'm actually doing is recognising that life and everything and faith is what God does, not what I do. So there's a sort of paradox here. There's a sort of active receptivity two contradictory verbs almost yes I'm, I'm acting in prayer I'm choosing to pray I'm making time I'm doing the actions of St Dominic or picking up my rosary or opening my breviary I'm doing but the point of prayer is to take me to a, a place of receptivity to what God is doing or a receptive activity you can turn the words around. We're trying to be faithful in prayer, but prayer takes us to a place and is inspired by the fact that it is God who is doing it all. And this is the last line of St Paul's letter here. And in fact, I think it's the last line of his letter, just about. He who calls you is faithful. And he will surely do it. Pistos hokalon. Faithful is the one who calls. This means a lot to me, my last story. Because when I... Which special event was it? When I became a Catholic, when I was received at 19, <coughs> from... Atheism via Anglicanism via lots of other complicated journeys. I was very helped by an Anglican chaplain that we had at school who now happens to be a Catholic priest. And that's another lovely story I can tell you. And when I was received um, to be a Catholic and to do my first communion uh, when I was 19, he gave me an icon of a beautiful little woodblock icon of Jesus carrying his cross. I think it was an icon of a stained glass, it was a picture of a stained glass window. Jesus with the crown of thorns, carrying his cross. Very beautiful. And on the back, he wrote out, in Greek and in English, this text of St Paul. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. And I feel like Robbie was giving me... Um, something to guide me through my whole Christian life and indeed through my whole priestly life and I think probably Robbie knew I was going to be a priest before I did back then of saying that if I'm going to start this business and of, of trying to live a Christian life seriously of becoming Catholic of celebrating the sacraments of living the Christian life and looking ahead if I'm going to be a priest never forget that it's all about God's faithfulness to you that he's called you. You didn't choose this. Why has he called you? He alone knows. He has called you. 
He is the faithful one. It's not, first of all, or ultimately, about your faith. It's about his faithfulness to you. And he will do it. He will accomplish what needs accomplishing. He will do the work through you that needs doing. He will make sure that even through your weaknesses and mistakes, he can bring you forward and lift you back up and not let you get lost. He is faithful. He is the one doing the work. And the more you can be open to him, as we've heard in St. Paul through prayer, the more he can work in you. So, Advent, three thoughts. Um, I haven't got notes to give you, but I've given you the, the New Testament text. So I hope that at each stage over the next three Sundays, when you come to these readings, I'm not saying you have to preach about them. You might. We don't often preach about the second reading. Um, but just have them in mind and, and think about these great gifts we've been given and, and the call that we're given to live this Advent. Thank you very much. Thank you.